Welcome, everyone. This is Jim Sporo with ISIP, the International Society of Service Innovation Professionals. And it's my pleasure to get you more introduced to Mark Anderson, who's a great colleague of mine from IBM days. He's retired like me now uh, down in New Zealand. And he's got some uh, wonderful insights to share with us about systems thinking, something called Kinevin, which many of you may not have heard of, but is important for systems thinkers to think about. Uh, he's very active in retirement, uh, advising governments on public policy, and he has some really great insights into, I think, um, uh, a view on hospitality that we would overlook if it wasn't for uh, this interaction we're going to have uh, today with Mark. So, Mark, could you just introduce yourself a little bit better to the ISAP community? Uh, thank, thank you, Jim. And um, my background is originally a, is a physicist. I have a PhD in uh, experimental physics from the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I graduated right at the time that uh, there were um, far too many physicists on the job market and that sent me uh, searching for a, a uh, related career path, and I became a um, systems engineer. And the first half of my career was in large-scale telco systems engineering. And that got me interested in, in the concepts of systems. But it, at that stage in my life, it was very much from an engineering point of view. And, and that was why IBM hired me. I um, had this background in, in large, large systems work. Uh, and IBM was getting into, into telcos. And then about halfway through my IBM career, um, which was both locally in New Zealand and, and all around the world, I worked for the Global Solutions Unit for IBM for a number of years, which took me uh, all over the world and took me through Almaden Research, where I met Jim uh, at least once or twice every year. That's right. and, uh, and, and, of course, Meeting Jim leads you into some fascinating conversations. And I became, the job I was working on stopped being how do you engineer a system to why are people investing in these systems? And that pushed me into a whole new uh, path of uh, searching for people who um, were looking at, as it turned out, uh, how do you uh, achieve large-scale change across uh, a public system, a health system, an education system, um, and and what 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 was necessary to think about that, and that led me to thinkers like Dave Snowden, who were picking up complexity theory from physics, uh, and then working out how to apply that in a practical organizational way, or in a in a in a large uh, multi organization system like a health system, or 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 um, education or generally service thinking. And um, that just sent me down the um, drawing on my, uh, my uh, academic background, sent me down the route of looking at uh, all sorts of different thinkers and introduced a huge, huge body of knowledge. Um, then very much in IBM, uh, it became about practically how do you build a business model to make anything work? How do you actually make money out of out of work? And one of the key tools that I then discovered was the through the work of Dave Snowden was and, and realized its practical application was Kinevin Decision Support Framework. Really a way of helping uh, executives, helping groups of people um, surface what's going on for them in their world um, and look at the nature of the decision they're having to make, whether it's obvious and clear to everyone and they can, can get consensus on both what is the issue to be addressed and how to address it. Um, through to, well, actually nobody knows. Um, mm -hmm. This is in a space with so much going on, so much uh, flow in it, and actually, we have to just take some action and um, see what the results of our action are. Right. And the Kinevin framework was just a very simple, but incredibly powerful way. It was originally designed to be able to be used in that classic consulting model of sit with a client over lunch and draw on a napkin. Yeah. And help the client think through um, what 
uh, they needed to do simply by using that very simple model. So I won't take you into the details of the Kinema framework because it's actually a marvelous synthesis of a huge body of knowledge from psychology, complexity theory, organizational theory, you name the breadth of, um, of input that's gone into that synthesis. But it's, a, but it's a very powerful synthesis and it's taught at West Point. It's taught yeah. now all, all over the world. Uh, and to you help meet with the decision. Kinevin Center in New Zealand and Australia, right? For so I established it with Dave Snowden's agreement uh, a, a company called Kinevin Research, independent but related to uh, the Kinevin company. Yeah. Uh, with the purposes of working um, in my home base on on actual projects, and I've kept that going since I retired. Uh, it's, yeah, I think uh, we like were lucky. I think we were lucky, Mark, because. Dave was at IBM, you were at IBM, I was at IBM, and IBM under Sam Palmazano decided to go big on Smarter Planet, which had smarter cities and was all about systems. So we were really lucky to have that time when IBM really started thinking big. That's when service science got going and SSME was because we started thinking about all these connected systems. And it's great that, you know, you've continued to... Uh, to you know, uh, work with the public policy people there in uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, on so many fronts. And um, uh, anyway, back to you. I, I didn't. I didn't well, I was, yeah, I, I I became very determined to uh, uh, to to actually concretely apply these concepts. Uh, the the reason for Kinevin Research is where. We're really researching the application of Kinevin concepts. That's where the the name comes from, and you don't do that in in as a as a pure purely uh, theoretical exercise. Actually, you bring theory and practice together, nice. and uh, and and that led us into working with. Uh, and for me, it's wonderful a, a whole range of service systems from. Uh, we do work with uh, the seafood industry in Australia in safety at sea. Yeah. Uh, we do work with uh, the Lantern Alliance, which is all about improving the quality of life um, for older Australians uh, through the joy of food. Yeah. Um, we, we work with, um, we, we uh, did a significant project with the Ministry of Education here in New Zealand and a series of schools around uh, understanding how uh, teachers were creating a positive environment for learning in their classrooms using a number of uh, using a psychological um, framework actually originally developed in the US called positive behavioral interventions and supports to to provide effectively a um, a, 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 a learning environment and all of these directly for me when I'm, I'm engaging with any of these clients um, it became very clear to me there was a powerful synthesis between um, service dominant logic, service systems thinking, and the Dave Snowden's complexity and narrative thinking. The two actually blend together, and the intersection of the blend, from my from my point of view, is really around one of the one of the key things that uh, is a service dominant logic uh, foundational principle is that value is uniquely and phenomenologically determined by the beneficiary. Yes. Well, if value is determined that way, how do you how do you measure it? How do you because because how do you get an insight into what's going on that matters? Uh, and you uh, I'm sorry, do we have a technical difficulty because you're freezing, Jim? I don't know if the, the uh, links. We, we had a brief one, but but you made a great point about service dominant logic and how do we measure it? And you're back. I hope I'm back. Um, yes, you're back. And that's that's a perfect transition to this. Uh, what we're trying to think about is in 10 years and we look back to today and we see these trends changing. What, what are the measures that matter in 10 years? Yes. And... Uh, um, uh, in all of the uh, groups that we've been working with, concepts like quality of life, uh, things like trusted relationships, all of these elements that are very much uh, personal perception-based uh, um, 
uh, value judgments there there um, the way the only way to really get at them is to listen to people's voice at scale give people the opportunity to describe their experience and reflect on their experience you actually collect data which is effectively a form of measurement that tells you how uh, people are perceiving the quality of their experience. Right. And the beauty of it is that in a service system, um, we are making so many practical, small decisions that affect the quality of people's daily lives. The, the way to get insight into that is not from quantitative predetermined measures, but actually to be able to listen to people describe their stories. Yeah, And human narrative carries the complexity of the practical world we live in. People people can, can describe that. But the traditional weakness in listening to people to describe their world is that we haven't uh, been able to manage it at scale. Yeah. You haven't been able to take it to a service system like a hospitality system where you've got hundreds of people or thousands of people coming into a restaurant or a dining uh, environment or, or so on. Uh, you, 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 the issue is getting the richness of qualitative insight um, available at scale and having people just not just describe to you what's going on for them, but be able to reflect on um, the significance of key issues that are at hand, key the key things that decisions have to be made about in their stories gives you a way of being able to collect quantitative data, uh, pattern data of, of what's going on, but be able to drill back from that data into the narrative. And so you're combining the best of the qualitative and the, and the, and the quantitative. And that's that's been the, the fundamental breakthrough in our in our view of of why people that we're working with in these different service systems have got excited about it. It's still very early days, um, but if you look at the Lantern work in Australia, for example, it's it's my my favourite tangible example of of a deliverable from what we're doing. It's improving the experience. Yeah. We will include those Vimeo links in the metadata for this recording so people can access it. That'll be great. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I've gone way over 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I think we're probably right on the money on 15 minutes, but I, I think the you've made a great point that um, we have to get better at measuring quality of life and through giving voice to people and not just on a specific... Uh, transactional kind of thing, but but more holistically for their quality of life. And there is this huge demographic shift, you know. And elderly leave their home and move into the communities. And um, that's a big thing that's happening in the US, China, and Japan, Finland. I mean, a lot of countries are facing this big demographic shift. And if we don't think about hospitality and quality of life, for the uh, older adults, uh, you know, we're missing a huge part of the future um, that uh, is really relevant, I think, to us in the uh, in the service uh, research and service innovation communities. So, thank you, Mark. Yes. For sharing that. Um, yes. Yeah, please, please, kind of, we can wrap up, and but please, you know, if there's anything else you'd like to say, we've got a minute or two, and. Uh... Um. I, my 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 one uh, comment would be additional thing I'd like to to highlight is um, uh, uh, it is um, th this is this is a very different science that I'm working with from the science I grew up with. As physicists, you were <laughs> you were taught to um, be able to measure uh, objectively in a system, and uh, and replication uh, was right. the 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 gold standard. Uh, and then when you move into service science, um, which is fundamentally about humans, or you start moving into things. Actually, you discover some of those foundational principles uh, just uh, can't and don't apply. For a starter, you are you are in the system, right? <laughs> there's 
<laughs> we are we are the system and we are in it <laughs> yes exactly so getting your head around that is i think something that uh, uh has been transformational for me yes. uh, uh uh actually uh i think the point i'm i'm really leading to is i've been living the process of transformation by reflecting on my own journey of just how much uh trying to engage with us trying to go after this uh grand challenge of taking the brilliant ideas of uh a whole range of thinkers um uh including particularly dave and but not just Dave, the whole network of people from Gerald Midgley, yourself, Jim, uh, Colin Harrison at IBM. There's a there's a, a there's there's hundreds of very very clever people out there that, uh, and and just trying to tr trying to wrestle with actually taking those ideas and applying them uh, has has forced where, you, where you've helped forced me to rethink. Is you, yeah, you're really very much about. Let's get this applied to real problems at scale, uh, at national yes. scale. So thank you, Mark, yes. very much for uh, doing this interview. And we'll try to get you more visible in the ISAP community. We'll discuss that uh, offline. But really, sincerely, thank you very much for taking the time to share these thoughts with us. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording now, if that's all right. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah, thank you.